Hi everybody, my name is Lori Mishley and I'm a clinician and a researcher in Seattle, Washington and we're running several clinical trials that are open to people not just living in the Pacific Northwest vicinity but globally. So what I want to do is just talk to you about the studies that we're running and how you can get involved and participate if you are interested in doing so. All right. CAM Care in PD stands for Complementary and Alternative Medicine in Parkinson's Disease. This is my labor of love. This is my hobby. This is something that I started about eight or nine years ago when I was starting to study epidemiology at the University of Washington. And it started out with me trying to ask some very simple questions. Um, could we find the people with Parkinson's who are doing unusually well? and the people who are doing unusually poorly, progressing slow or progressing fast, could we find them, could we describe them, and could we describe what they, the fast progressors were doing differently than the slow progressors? Because there wasn't an outcome measure that existed that could have, would have met the needs of this internet-based study, we built a new outcome measure. It's called the PROPD. Any one of you can go to the website right now, get your score, see how you compare to other people diagnosed at the same time that you were. So what we've been doing is for the last seven years now, the study has been live. For seven years, we have enrolled to over 2,200 people with Parkinsonism. 1,600 of those people have idiopathic Parkinson's disease. And every six months, we send a survey to all of these individuals who have part enrolled um, and we send you a survey and we ask who are you, how are you, and what are you doing? That's it. It takes about an hour to an hour and a half every six months. However, what we see when we pool 2,000 people's data together, what we learn is that the people who are eating the most vegetables and the people who have the most friends are actually progressing notably slower than people who don't eat many vegetables and who feel lonely. And so there are a lot of things that we've already begin, begun to learn from this study and it's already getting better and better and better. The study is still enrolling. Um, there are people who have been in it since day one. There are some people who have participated for a couple years, they got busy, they stopped and they've re-entered. We welcome everybody, every single person who has any type of neurodegenerative disease, Parkinsonism, Parkinson's plus disorder, uh, we invite you to participate. This isn't just for people with idiopathic Parkinson's disease. We are looking, um, in fact, that would be it, one thing that we would really like to see more of um, in the up upcoming years are for people with other forms of Parkinsonism to enroll. Um, there is no cost to be in the study. You do not get paid to be in the study. The nice thing about it is you can do it from the comfort of your own home. There's no clinic visit required. It's all entirely internet based. We are allowing people from any place in the world to participate. So we have, um, I believe, about 85% of our people, of our current participants, are from the United States and Canada. But we have representation from, I want to say it's about 20 different countries at this point. And so, um, we, it, again, diversity is really important. So I'd like to show you what we've already begun to learn from this study. Um, if you go to the website livinghealthywithparkinsons.com, this study was brought to you by some very generous donors here in the Parkinson's community. Uh, they appreciated this project, they appreciated the results that this project was providing, and they were frustrated by the fact that word wasn't getting out. Even though I had published in the peer-reviewed medical journals some of the findings from this research study, they weren't seeing the um, what we were learning in the research study being put into practice, and they thought more people should know about it. And so they asked us to um, focus on dissemination of research findings. So earlier this year, in 2020, we did an updated data analysis of, of new people who had entered the study over the last seven years. So we weren't looking at change over time, but we were looking at every single person who has come into this study on the day that they enrolled, they gave us a bunch of information about themselves. And what we've learned is absolutely fascinating. Just to be clear, these results are not looking at symptomatic improvement, but rate of progression. We are looking at the accumulation of new symptoms over time. We don't really want to call it neuroprotection because we don't know that neurons are actually surviving longer. It may be that 
fewer neurons are just working better. We don't actually know why people are getting better or having fewer symptoms, but what we do see is that um, we're talking about people's symptoms typically increase over time. And what I'm looking at is our and what I'm looking at is whether or not be changes in behaviors can affect one's rate of progression. So our data suggests that the first two days of exercise each week seem to not count a whole bunch. We don't actually see that there is a decrease in symptom progression among people who only exercise one or two days a week. We really need to see people getting up to three days a week and beyond before we can actually start to see changes, a reduction in disease progression over time. The other thing that we have learned from these data that I think is really fascinating is the role of social isolation and loneliness on Parkinson's disease severity and progression. We just uh, submitted a paper on loneliness and Parkinson's and I hope that will be published soon, but we've already presented this poster at a conference showing that people who perceive themselves as lonely have worse symptoms. Every single Parkinson's symptom that we measured, all 33 of them, is rated worse by people who are lonely. When we compare the constipation score of a not lonely person to a lonely person, the lonely person tends to be more constipated. They tend to have worse sleep. They tend to have more pain. They have to tend to have a worse tremor. And so what we saw is across the board, symptoms were worse for lonely people. And even though people associate Parkinson's disease with tremor, tremor is kind of the hallmark symptom of Parkinson's disease, what, what these data suggest is that tremor doesn't have a huge bearing on people's quality of life. Whether you have no tremor, a little tremor, or a severe tremor, uh, tremor doesn't actually correlate very well with whether or not you have a low or a high quality of life. Um, but what we did see is that if you have a lot of friends or whether or not you're lonely, it makes a huge, huge impact on your overall quality of life. And so that might be obvious to a lot of us, but from the, as the scientific community looks at loneliness and Parkinson's disease, that's something that we haven't paid attention to. When we enroll people in studies, we don't even ask whether or not they're lonely, and yet here's this huge thing that's affecting people's symptom severity. So these are things that I think researchers need to be paying more attention to, physicians need to start asking more questions about in practice, and it's something that patients might be able to um, fix, treat, um, easy. It might not be easy to improve your sleep or improve your constipation or improve your balance, but it might not be that hard to pick up the phone and call a friend or get online and learn how to join some of these Facebook groups or um, have, have your kids over for dinner a little more often, things like that. Um, plugging into community may be something that is actually easy to do for some people and might translate to improvement over time. So I'm excited to see this uh, field of social health become a part of the conversation in Parkinson's disease and this study has largely enabled us to look at that in a new way. The other thing that we have learned is that what you eat matters. Um, what we've learned is that the people with the slowest rate of Parkinson's disease progression are eating the most fresh fruits, fresh vegetables, nuts and seeds, non-fried fish, olive oil, coconut oil, wine, and fresh herbs. The people with the fastest rate of Parkinson's disease progression are eating the most canned fruit, canned vegetables, fried foods, soda, especially diet soda, beef, pork, chicken, dairy, especially ice cream, cheese, yogurt, milk, pasta, and frozen vegetables um, are all associated with faster rates of Parkinson's progression. People who have trouble affording food and affording healthy food have a faster rate of Parkinson's progression, and people who try to eat organic and shop at their local co-ops and farmers markets actually have a slower rate of Parkinson's progression. So we still don't have these double-blind placebo-controlled trials that tell us if you start shopping at the local co-op that your disease will progress will start to proceed slower. Um, but we do have data saying that people who are doing unusually well have a lot of things in common. 
And so for right now, my advice with my patients in the online class that I'm teaching is that until better data becomes available, let's just follow suit. Let's do what the success stories are doing. Those people who have had Parkinson's disease for 10, 20 years and are still very hardly have any symptoms and have a high quality of life, let's do what they're doing. Those people who have only had Parkinson's disease for a few years and they're in really rough shape, let's not do what they're doing. Everybody is a teacher, let's learn from them. So we are just getting started. Like I said, we're seven years in, but I hope this will be a long-term study that will have, be ongoing for years to come. I hope that we can come up with the money to add biomarkers and start measuring people's vitamin D levels and B12 levels and glutathione levels and things like that. But right now, um, we are looking for people with any type of diagnosis of Parkinson's disease to please join the study. It's two visits a year, about an hour, hour and a half each. You can do it from your own living room. You can start it, take a break, and come back later. Um, but we would love for you to participate, people from other countries, people with alternative forms of Parkinson's diagnoses. Um, and as you can see from those slides I just presented, uh, there really truly is power in numbers. Um, and what I actually like most about this study is that it's not the researcher or the clinician telling patients what to do. Hey, go try this. Hey, let's do that. Um, what's really neat about this study is the patients with Parkinson's disease are the ones who are teaching us. You guys pool all of your data together and we are able to see things that you can't see by yourself, but collectively start to paint a picture of how this disease works. And so I love that it's the patients who actually are holding the secret and the patients are the ones with the answers and it's our job to just shut up and ask you what you're doing, how you're doing and write some code that describes the, those who, of you who have been most successful. So. Um, that's the CAM care study and I'll put up the information for how to participate in that. What happens is when you go to the website, the CAM care and PD website, which is hosted by Bastyr University, there's, there are two steps to participation. Step one is the online consent form. Before you can participate in the study, we need you to download that consent form, open this up and read it. We want you to know why we're doing this study, um, what it means to participate, what to expect in terms of how often you'll hear from us, um, what happens if you change your mind and you don't want to participate anymore. That's step one. After you have read that consent form and you've decided that this is a study that you would like to participate in, then you come over to the second link on the website that takes you directly to the study. And the first thing we will ask you is, did you read the consent form and is this a study you would like to participate in? And if you say yes, then we can use the data that you get, share with us following. And that's it. Most people um, have told us that it's a fairly easy study to participate in. All right, so please consider participating in that.